on this episode of China Unscripted. It's been one year since China forced the national security law on Hong Kong, and it's been worse than anyone predicted. What can the world do to help Hong Kong? Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today once again is Benedict Rogers, co-founder and chief executive of Hong Kong Watch. Well, Benedict, thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. It's so always good to be with you. Definitely. I, and I always like to see our, our little Winnie the Pooh friend in the background. Yes, absolutely. He's, uh, he's a permanent fixture there, but especially when I talk to you guys. <laughs> uh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know he's always watching. Yes. <laughs> so big anniversary is happening on July 1st, the one year anniversary of the draconian national security law in Hong Kong, uh, the anniversary of the handover of Hong Kong in 1997, and it's the 100-year anniversary of the founding of the PRC, People's Republic of China. Oh, 100-year fo- of the founding of the Communist Party of China. Oh, yes, yeah, excuse me. It's the founding of the Communist Party of China. Um, so a week of bad anniversaries. Yes. All right, so, so when the national security law was put in place, they said, oh, don't worry, it's not going to change any of the freedoms of Hong Kong. You'll still have all your freedoms. It will only affect a small minority of people. Oh, small, small minority of people. So why don't you give us a, a quick rundown of some of the things that have changed over the past 12 months in Hong Kong? Yeah, um, it, it's been absolutely devastating. It's basically destroyed Hong Kong's uh, freedoms. So we've seen, uh, for example, at the start of this year, uh, pro-democracy, for, I think 40, 47 pro-democracy uh, politicians, activists, candidates, uh, pollsters, whose only crime was to have held a primary uh, uh, to choose their candidates for the Legislative Council elections, which of course was then postponed anyway. Um, and they've been charged under the national security law uh, for for that crime of holding a, a primary. Uh, we've seen other plenty of other people arrested. Uh, We've seen the whole pro-democracy camp uh, effectively expelled from the Legislative Council last uh, November. Uh, And most significantly, the leading pro-democracy entrepreneur and media tycoon Jimmy Lai in prison. Uh, He hasn't had his trial yet, but he's in prison on charges under the national, national security law. Uh, And five of his key staff, the editor of the Apple Daily and four senior executives last week, uh, arrested under the same law. And now today, the closure of uh, the Apple Daily newspaper. Uh, And that's just a a summary of some of the things that have happened. I think one of the other things I personally found is that I went from being in daily contact uh, with dozens of people in Hong Kong um, before the national security law was imposed on on the city. Uh, And since the law was was imposed, Initially, I, I, all my contacts dried up, um, partly because I didn't want to put people in danger and partly because other people were nervous about contacting me. More recently, I've had a bit of contact with a handful of people intermittently and extremely cautiously, but um, it's a big change. So instead of only affecting a small minority of people, basically, Hong Kong is now a totalitarian government with no freedom of the press, no freedom of speech and arbitrary detentions. That's that's exactly right. It's it's gone from being one of Asia's most open cities now to being its one, one of its most repressed. It's now just another city in China. Exactly. I mean, how does the repression in Hong Kong compare to a city like Shanghai? Well, it's it's getting closer and closer to uh, Shanghai or to, to mainland China's Chinese cities by the day. I think probably one of the big differences that's still it, there at the moment uh, is that people do, when they're arrested, they do face a trial. A trial. Uh, they can have uh, legal representation. Uh, and although there was severe police brutality in the protests in 2019, 2020, um, and, and certainly mistreatment in detention, there isn't evidence of the kind of systematic torture and disappearance into so-called black jails, in, in which is the case in mainland China. So There's a degree of better treatment in prison, but day-to-day life is moving ever closer to uh, life in mainland China. So what you're saying is the national security law still has some progress to go. 
<laughs> well, yes. And in fact, just uh, the other day, the Secretary for Security, John Lee, has, has said that the Hong Kong government is going to introduce further legislation to fill the gaps that the national ah. security law <laughs> doesn't cover. And, uh, you know, you, we kind of thought uh, the national security law would be enough, that they'd be satisfied with that. But no, it appears um, they want to do more. Do you think the Great Firewall of China will find its way into Hong Kong? I think it's a distinct possibility. I mean, there have already been a handful of incidents of websites uh, being blocked or taken down, or it's it's certainly a possibility. And, and that really would be the end of, of Hong Kong as an international center. Well, in terms of you mentioned earlier, the judiciary, like Hong Kong still has this independent judiciary. And that's another thing that makes it right attractive to businesses rather than going into mainland China, where, uh, you know, you're never going to get a ruling that's favorable to you. It's always going to be on the side of like the Chinese companies and the Chinese government. Do you see that changing under the national security law as well? Uh, I do. And I think there is there is increasing uh, evidence of of pressure on the judiciary. Uh, just recently, uh, there was a report that uh, pro-Beijing legislators intervened to stop the appointment of one particular judge. Uh, so I think we are seeing uh, creeping uh, undermining of judicial independence. And, and certainly people I talk to uh, from Hong Kong uh, say basically their feeling is it's already gone, that, uh, that judges are feeling the pressure to deliver the sentences that the CCP wants. Well, on a related note, Jimmy Lai is facing life imprisonment for violating the national security law. But but what did, what exactly did he do? Well, exactly. He uh, published a newspaper that was critical of, of the CCP. Uh, he met uh, foreign uh, politicians and uh, foreign activists. Um, one of the things that was actually cited um, among many things was that he followed me on Twitter, which <laughs> oh God, I never I realized you on Twitter, be... too. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's that's like a list of some of the things he's done that he faces life in prison for. Absolutely, it's. Um, I mean, if the consequences weren't so tragic and and horrific, it would be uh, almost comical because it's so absurd. Um, uh, and the problem with this national security law is that it's so vaguely defined uh, and so widely applied. I mean, there's even a clause in the national security law. Uh, that um, applies extraterritorially. So um, pretty much every day, uh, several times a day since July the 1st last year, uh, I've been in breach of the national security law uh, just by talking about these issues in interviews and webinars and so on from my home in London. Now, I, I'm not <laughs> scared by that because I'm here in London and safe. But, but in principle, that law can be applied uh, around the world. So if you go back to Hong Kong, they have every right under their law to arrest you and put you in prison. That's right. In in principle, yes. Um, now, I, I was denied entry to Hong Kong in 2017. So I'm working on the assumption that I can't go back to Hong Kong uh, or that if I did, I, I uh, would not be uh, I would not be treated um, with with a great welcome. Uh, now, now, Matt, you actually kind of touched on an interesting point, like. If you went back, you would be in violation of their law. You know, for years, the international community has been telling the Communist Party of China, you know, play by international rules. You need to have like the rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Communist Party essentially did take that advice, but they twisted it where they they are making all kinds of laws that essentially legalizes their own horrible totalitarian system. So it's, and then it's, they're making it apply internationally. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's just it's just so weird. Like, you know, there's been all this talk about, you know, China, follow the rules, follow the rules. And like they are. Oh, all you have it, to do is change the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, basically, they've confused rule of law with rule by law. Um, and they're going with rule by law in the sense that they make up the laws. Uh, they can change the laws. They, they apply the laws. And they expect everyone to live by their laws. Um, there's a very interesting anecdote that the former British Foreign Secretary, Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who was the Foreign Secretary for the two years uh, leading up to the handover of Hong Kong, uh, often tells where he, in the final negotiations before the handover, he, uh, in one of his encounters with his Chinese uh, counterpart, the Chinese Foreign Minister, 
Malcolm Rifkin emphasized the importance of uh, rule of law. And the Chinese foreign minister said, oh, yes, yes, we, we, we agree with that. Uh, uh, we have rule of law in China. Um, in China, the people must obey the law. Uh, and Malcolm Rifkin said, no, no, but um, you don't understand. Rule of law means the government is under the law uh, as well. And, and, and people in government have to abide by the law. And apparently the Chinese foreign minister looked at him as if he was from another planet and just couldn't grasp the, the concept. It sounded ludicrous to him. Well, in China, according to the Constitution, they have freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Well, that's right. I mean, on paper, Just like in Hong and, Kong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think in, in Chinese, uh, rule of law, rule by law, it's actually the same. It's like fa yu, something like that, right? Where it's there's there's no preposition so it's it's just law rule mm. and so it's it's open to a maybe a, a wider interpretation by design not by an accident of the language but simply they they like to interpret it as you know law rule means they get to use the law to rule everyone else yeah and then they yeah. can say oh we're following this yeah uh, absolutely and, and and they can um, kind of define the law as they go along. So with the national security law, they started, as you said at the beginning, by saying it'll only affect a small number of people. Your freedoms will be intact. Uh, and then suddenly you know, holding a primary election or uh, talking to a foreign journalist or, or talking to a, uh, a, a U.S. politician um, is a threat to national security. So what you're saying is the Chinese Communist Party lied and broke their promise <laughs> what a surprise yeah wow. never would have believed it well no they just need to redefine how much a small minority is right like it, <laughs> it, that's it, a good point well i think that it's interesting because people keep trying to pin the hong kong government down or the the party down on what exactly the law means like the national security law where they're like, well, how did how did Apple Daily violate the national security law? Like what specific articles did they write that violated the national security law? You know, and because it's so vague and people keep thinking that, you know, if we just pin them down, if we can get them to define what the specific things are, then we'll know. Right. Carrie Lam will be like, oh, no, you're right. We've done something horribly wrong. Well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not that, but just that, like, you know, they want to know where the lines are. But the purpose of the law is to be vague. It's it, it, like it happens in a lot of kind of communist like this is how the communist governments make laws specifically as vague catch all things that they can then interpret however they want to. And, and so, enforce however they want. Yeah, so it's not like they, oh, well, like they made a mistake. They didn't really define this. It's just so they can define it however they want. That That's exactly right. And one of the other things in this is that they said when the law was first imposed uh, that uh, it would not be applied uh, retrospectively. Um, I don't know uh, because I, ha well, I don't think any of us know um, whether the articles that are being cited in the case of uh, Apple Daily uh, were articles published before or after the national security law. But what I do know, just one personal example, is um, I wrote uh, for every week for the last uh, one year until last week, uh, I wrote a weekly column uh, for the English language section of the Apple Daily's uh, website. And they never once uh, changed what I wrote. They never uh, edited me, censored me, told me what to write. Uh, except on one occasion um, where after the first police raid of the Apple Daily Newsroom in August last year, I wrote a piece uh, mostly paying tribute to the Apple Daily staff for their extraordinary courage and then saying what the international community should do in response. And I had a couple of lines on sanctions uh, saying that we should have targeted sanctions. And the Apple Daily uh, editor, not the editor of the newspaper, but the editor that I dealt with, uh, came back to me and said, we love your article, we agree with it, but we're really sorry that this one sentence uh, is a, a real red line uh, under the national security law, and we will be in real trouble if we publish this. And I said, the last thing I want to do is get you into trouble, so I can just take that line out. And they said, great. And so they ran the piece. So in other words, they were sensitive uh, in that example to the fact that calling for sanctions would breach the national security law. So my suspicion is that 
the government's accusation that they were calling for sanctions probably relates to articles published before the national security law. And if that's the case, and the law is being applied retrospectively, that's, um, that's very concerning. Well, that's the thing about this. Like, you know, they they, obviously Apple Daily tried to not cross any obvious red lines. It doesn't matter. Mm. They were they had it in for Apple Daily from the beginning. And kind of like what Shelley was mentioning about how people try and find like, oh, what specific uh, articles have people violated? None of that matters because it's they've they've created this like vague rule system that they can do just whatever they want. And as long as people try and play by the rules, it'll never work. You just have to recognize that the Chinese regime is a horrible, brutal, bad, bad, bad. When you say people are trying to play by the rules, you're talking about, you know, people outside Hong Kong, yeah, like, well, like try companies and or within yeah. the, the, the framework of how the Communist Party sets up the game. You just got to jump out of that and say what it is that the Chinese Communist Party is an illegitimate gangster regime and just not play by the rules. Imagine if the U.S. did that. The Communist Party would not be able to do this, which which is why I think Hong Kong is such a, a, a big issue for the Communist Party. I mean, because it's really kind of proving that there's not a whole lot the international community can do to rein in the Communist Party when it wants to do something. I, I think uh, that there's a lot of truth in, in that, but I also think there is a lot more that the international community can do that it's not yet doing. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps it's perhaps it's starting to. I mean, there are signs that countries are uh, finally waking up. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think if there is um, a much more coordinated uh, and robust effort by the free world, the democratic world, um, that, that could result in, in pressure on the Chinese Communist Party that... Uh, that could rein it in. The, yeah, it just needs to, people need to start treating the Communist Party like an illegitimate government. Yep. So you don't, you can't have like Angela Merkel saying, well, we need to sell cars in China. Or the Olympics. Or the Olympics. Yeah, I was reading Dominic Rob. The UK foreign minister had tweeted this thing about how, you know, the the closure of Apple Daily shows the restrictions on freedom in Hong Kong that the national security law wasn't supposed to happen, but happened. And I was reading this and thinking, but it's good that he said this, but what can the UK actually do anything about what's happening? Well, I I actually uh, retweeted his statement just about an hour or so ago and said exactly the same thing that you've just said. I said, this is a very welcome statement, but statements alone, however strong they are, uh, are not going to cause the Chinese Communist Party to uh, rethink. We we need action, and specifically, we need uh, targeted sanctions. And the UK has not yet uh, applied, it's applied a handful of sanctions in response to the situation in Xinjiang, uh, but even then, they didn't sanction the party secretary, uh, Chen Chuangguo, uh, who's responsible for, for, he's really the architect of the intensifying uh, persecution, arguably genocide uh, of the Uyghurs. So he's not on the sanctions list, but they haven't applied these sanctions at all in relation to Hong Kong. So um, I think that's really my my point that I was making a, a moment ago, which is that we can't just ha- keep having statements. Um, we, we we need coordinated robust action. Uh, and when you say targeted sanctions, you mean kind of what the, the United States has done? Yes, absolutely. I think the United States has uh, set a very good example uh, in that regard. And I think that if other countries followed and did it together, because I can understand, you know, the UK or Canada or some U- European countries might not want to uh, act alone and therefore risk uh, retaliation from Beijing specifically against them. But if they all act together, is Beijing going to retaliate against everyone together? Well, maybe, but but the, you know, there's safety in numbers, and so I think countries should follow the U.S. example. As far as the U.K. goes, you know, the U.K. was essentially responsible for giving Hong Kong to China, including Hong Kong Island and Kowloon, which arguably never really belonged to China. But then the U.K. basically signed this. I don't, I don't know if you call it a treaty or, or or a legally binding agreement, but whatever it was for the handover in 1997, like, doesn't the UK have a special 
obligation or a special role to play in terms of dealing with this broken promise? Oh, yes, it, it definitely does. I mean, it has a special responsibility, uh, both for historic and moral reasons, but I would say for legal reasons as well as a signatory to the Sino-British Joint Declaration, um, which is an international treaty. It, it's registered at the United Nations. I mean, the weakness of the Sino-British Joint Declaration is that there's no enforcement mechanism attached to it. Uh, so when it was drafted, there was nothing in there saying what could be done if if one party uh, breached it. But nevertheless, uh, the UK definitely has an obligation to, uh, to to speak out and to and to act in whatever ways it can uh, for Hong Kong. Why do you think there was no enforcement mechanism put in place? Uh, I well, I think it was uh, probably naivety on the on the British side that they uh, this concept of one country two systems was proposed by Deng Xiaoping, pr- proposed by the Chinese side. Uh, it sounded good. Um, and I suppose at the time people thought, w- you know, we have reason to believe uh, that they'll honor it. And um, they, they didn't uh, seek, seek to look at the consequences if, if it wasn't on it. I mean, it, it was still several years before they started to breach it. <laughs> it was. Um, 2003, right? Yeah. That was the first big one. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I lived in Hong Kong for the first five years after the handover from 97 to 2002. And I would say that uh, when I left in 2002, I left reasonably optimistic that uh, Hong Kong was doing OK. Not perfect, um, but but doing reasonably well. One country, two systems was broadly intact. The basic freedoms that people enjoyed were there. And if anything, uh, the the subtle violations that I did see. I worked as a journalist there uh, and on the uh, newspaper that I'd worked on, um, when it was uh, bought uh, by a a Hong Kong uh, tycoon, Charles Ho, about halfway uh, into my my time on the newspaper, it started to change course. It had been a very pro-democracy, sort of free speaking, uh, critical, independent publication, and it became much less so. Um, but I saw that as not so much Beijing's intervention as more self-censorship on the part of uh, the, the the proprietor and uh, and some of the editors. Um, and it was really, apart from 2003 uh, and, and sort of creeping erosion of Hong Kong's freedoms in subsequent years, the turning point, I think, was the 2014 umbrella movement. Um, and it was from then on that we really saw uh, the, um, the the increasingly rapid uh, destruction of Hong Kong's freedoms. Um, now, you're the co-founder and um, chief executive of Hong Kong Watch. How have how, what's been happening with your your organization since the national security law? How have things changed? Well, I think the key thing that has changed uh, is that, uh, as I said earlier, we we used to be in daily contact with people in Hong Kong, and now uh, we're hardly in touch with anyone on the ground. Um, uh, I think the other thing that has changed, of course, is that uh, a number of the people we were in touch with in Hong Kong have left Hong Kong. So we we are still in touch with them, but in a different context. Uh, so people like uh, the former legislator Ted Hui, uh, Nathan Law, and and other lesser known uh, activists um, have left the city uh, and are trying to do what they can uh, in exile. Um, so those are probably the two big changes. And and I think perhaps the third change is that rather late in the day, the international community and, and particularly the UK uh, has reacted and has woken up and has done more than it was doing before. So, for example, the, the UK's uh, British National Overseas uh, program, uh, where uh, potentially uh, th- three million uh, BNO status holders from Hong Kong and their dependents. So potentially up to 5 million Hong Kongers uh, are eligible to come to the UK. uh, And we're not going to see that kind of number coming, but we're certainly seeing uh, thousands of people already uh, taking up the offer. Um, My view is that was a very welcome uh, and and quite courageous step by the UK, but it was pretty late in the day. And if the UK had taken a, a stronger line earlier on, maybe we wouldn't have ended up in the position we're in. 
Yeah, it seems to me like uh, with all the Hong Kongers in exile, it's 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 becoming kind of similar to the uh, Tibetan movement. Yes, I think that's that's true, and and one of the perhaps encouraging uh, uh, sign, encouraging developments, and and a sign of just how bad things have have got, uh, is that increasingly different groups who um, face uh, C- the CCP's repression uh, are um, forming alliances. So you see more and more Hong Kongers and Tibetans uh, and Uyghurs uh, and Falun Gong practitioners. Um, together at demonstrations outside Chinese embassies or outside parliaments. Uh, and that's a good thing. Yeah. It's funny, Shelley, what were you telling me earlier today about like Falun Gong being sort of like uh, a metric in Hong Kong? Oh, yeah. Right after the national security, like in the first couple months after the national security law was put in place, I saw somebody tweeting just like a like a regular Hong Konger you know, one of them who hadn't already left Twitter in fear that what they could say would get them in trouble was saying that, honestly, seeing the Falun Gong banners on the streets in Hong Kong had become his kind of litmus test for whether or not it was time to get out of Hong Kong. That, like, if he saw that, like, Falun Gong banners were gone, that they were that they were going underground or were banned, that he was like, this is it, like, this is time to leave. Because, you know, Falun Gong has been allowed in Hong Kong's even after they were no longer allowed uh, in mainland China. So, you know, these are the kind of things or, you know, Apple Daily was probably a metric for some people. Like the how do you see what's the canary in the coal mine? Yeah, absolutely. No, I I can see that. And I mean, it's very concerning that in recent weeks we have seen uh, more pressure on uh, Falun Gong in Hong Kong. I, I, I think there was a um, an Epoch Times journalist who was who was attacked physically. Uh, the printers uh, that, that were uh, also physically attacked. Um, so that's definitely something to to watch uh, in in the weeks and months ahead. Do you think we're going to see a bigger Hong Kong exile movement now than perhaps we had been seeing over the last year? I think so. I mean, I think that, uh, and what. What I think we've seen over the last year is uh, primarily uh, those who needed to get out fast uh, getting out. So those who were in uh, or felt themselves to be in uh, immediate danger. Um, What I think we'll see going forward is um, ordinary Hong Kongers who perhaps were not politically active, uh, but um, feeling that uh, they don't want their kids to be going to school and being indoctrinated uh, by the CCP. They don't want to spend their days reading uh, China Daily or or Xinhua instead of uh, Apple Daily um, and that sort of thing. People whose whose way of life has now changed um, as as freedoms have been dismantled and and as it becomes more and more a a CCP-controlled city, um, I I think uh, we'll see those sort of people. And, and, I mean, we'll have to see how how business and the financial sector is affected, but um, the uh, the pressure on banks to freeze people's, uh, the the, uh, assets of political activists um, is one sign of, of, uh, of the financial coercion in the city. So, yeah, I think we will see more people leaving who who didn't have to get out quickly, but who will start to make preparations to get out. Of course, there is concern that the Hong Kong government has introduced or is introducing legislation uh, that will uh, tighten controls on on exit, uh, a new immigration bill that takes effect in August uh, that gives them the power to stop people leaving the city. Uh, and we'll have to see how they deploy that power. But that's certainly causing concern. So we may see quite a significant number of people trying to get out between now and uh, and August. Hong well, Kong's becoming a prison. Well, I mean, I was going to say serious East Germany vibes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If they actually are able to stop people from from leaving. I mean, I know that um, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has said, you know, we should the U.S. should make it easier for people to come for Hong Kong, like uh, Hong Kong refugees and. And you mentioned, Benedict, the UK program. Um, what I kind of wonder is whether Western governments will kind of see this as enough. Like, if we let people come from Hong Kong, from Hong Kong exiles. Assuming they can get out. Yeah, like that this is this is our role and we don't 
there's nothing else we can do. Like the most that we can do is kind of give them a place to flee to. Yeah, that's definitely a real danger. And that's one of my messages in our advocacy uh, to um, the British government in particular to say, what you've done on the BNO uh, scheme is is fantastic and should be should be applauded, but it shouldn't let the government off the hook in terms of uh, looking at what else it can do. And it doesn't, of course, solve the situation for the people of Hong Kong. Uh, it it gives those who who want it a lifeline out of the city. Um, but for those who either choose to stay in the city or for whatever reason uh, just can't uh, leave. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't change their situation. So, um, I, I'm definitely encouraging other governments to uh, to help, um, and particularly for those who are um, born after 1997 who aren't eligible for the BNO scheme. Uh, many of whom are the young frontline protesters who are most vulnerable and who who will be feeling that they don't have a future in Hong Kong. Um, we should be providing a lifeline to them. But at the same time, we should be looking at every other possible action we can take to put pressure on the CCP for for what it's done. At least, even if we can't stop the repression in the short to medium term, we should make the CCP pay as high a possible a, a price for what they've done. Because if we don't, and if we allow them to get away with with what they've done, um, we can be sure it, they're not going to stop with Hong Kong. You know, Taiwan is already in in their sights and. They'll be emboldened to go further with Taiwan if they think there are no costs for what they've done to Hong Kong. I think that also kind of ties into the coronavirus, too. If they if they get away with that, mm. what can they get away with? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, is there anything that the UK or, or US governments could do if they had the political willpower to actually turn back the tide of the national security law? and the encroachment of freedoms in Hong Kong. Is that even possible? I think um, it's difficult to see that in the short to medium term. But what I think could be done is to, um, through targeted sanctions, both on individual officials uh, and on uh, enterprises that are uh, close to the CCP, that are complicit with, for example, uh, the surveillance state uh, enterprises that are of strategic value to the CCP, um, if we had sanctions uh, on those entities and individuals, it would start to make some people within uh, the CCP uh, question the direction that they're going in and the direction that Xi Jinping is taking them in. If they start to feel their personal finances are affected, their ability to travel is affected, uh, their ability to send their kids to universities and schools uh, overseas uh, is is impacted, um, then that may may result in some pressure for change within the CCP, uh, maybe even one day uh, the fall of the CCP, which is what I think we, we would all like to see. Um, but at least the emboldening of um, more uh, moderate, for, for want of a better word, uh, people in the CCP who, who might then force a change of direction. Um, that's difficult to achieve, but I think not impossible in the medium term. What I think is really interesting about the fact that they, you know, said that Apple Daily's crime, quote unquote, was talking about sanctions or or asking foreign governments to inflict sanctions on Hong Kong and China is it really shows how scared mm. the Chinese Communist Party is of sanctions. Uh, and I think we've like it's pretty clear because they've also tried to, they're moving in the direction of trying to do things like the digital yuan or trying to form something that's like an alternative to the SWIFT banking system that is essentially, you know, under U.S. control in a certain way because it runs on the U.S. dollar. So anybody who gets sanctioned cannot use the SWIFT system anymore, which all of the international banks use. So there are a lot of ways in which sanctions really kind of cut at the the core of the Communist Party's fear, which is that they'll be cut off from the money supply, like the Western money supply. So I think it's really important that while we can still sanction them, that the governments do it. Uh, and that's something that, you know, like you said earlier, Benedict, it, it has a real impact. And I think it's not just, it's not just hoping that, you know, there would be some kind of like internal change within the Communist Party, like that 
you know, Communist Party members would necessarily, you know, say we're not going to Xi Jinping like, oh, you know, we can't uh, do these policies. What might happen is that there's just a certain level of disobedience. And this we've seen this with um, things that have happened inside China. For example, uh, with Falun Gong, they've had some campaigns where they've run to call the officials who are in charge of police stations or local detention centers, uh, get people to call from abroad and kind of tell them that, you know, people know what they're doing. They Mm. know they're torturing people and things like that. And in some cases, like the local, you know, head of this police uh, center or whatever will back off because they're afraid. Mm. Um, So they're not going to be able to say, well, officially say, I'm not going to, you know, follow this policy but they might quietly like release all the Falun Gong practitioners they have in prison. Mm, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I I totally agree. And I think it's clear that they there are two things the CCP hates. They they hate uh, sanctions, um, uh, and they and they really hate the truth being exposed. Um, and and we see that by the way they react. Um, so, for example, um, when the UK uh, imposed uh, a few very very limited sanctions against a handful of officials um, because of the uh, genocide in in Xinjiang. China's response was uh, to sanction a whole load of uh, British um, members of parliament and and entities, including, uh, I mean, I myself am not uh, named individually, but the Conservative Party Human Rights Commission, which I'm the co-founder and deputy chair, uh, is on uh, China's sanctions list. Um, and they did the same with some European politicians and, and U.S. and Canadian politicians. So that sort of retaliation uh, shows that they that they really don't like it. And, and the reality is their sanctions against us uh, are totally ineffective. Certainly in my case, um, I'm already banned from Hong Kong. So it, banning me from travel makes no difference. I don't have <laughs> any assets uh, uh, in China. Um, so it has no practical consequence for me, um, but it is a sign that um, what we do has some effect on on them. And our, I think our sanctions against them uh, are far more effective on them than than their retaliation. Um, but the other uh, the other thing that they're scared of, as I said, is is uh, exposing the truth. And the, their reaction to the recent uh, Uyghur tribunal um, in in London was extraordinary. The number of press conferences they had denouncing it. Uh, and denouncing it in in extreme ways. I mean, accusing Sir Geoffrey Nice, uh, who of course had previously chaired the China Tribunal on forced organ harvesting, uh, accusing him of being a, a, a British um, intelligence agent. And I, I wrote a piece actually saying, I'm a big admirer of Geoffrey Nice, but that having um, experienced his driving uh, in Dubrovnik. Uh, I'm I'm pretty confident in in confirming that he's not uh, 007. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but that kind of reaction from Beijing um, just shows that they they really they do feel the pressure. Um, yeah, a good metric is just seeing what they are the most vocal about hating and doing more of that thing. Mm. Yeah, there was a lot of Global Times articles about the Uyghur Tribunal. And I found it interesting because they didn't really respond to the China tribunal in the same way. But I also think it's because the China tribunal had more of a splash than uh, the Communist Party probably expected. Because when that started, it wasn't like a hugely, you know, publicized, like it wasn't really covered in all the papers. But once they came out with their verdict, I remember seeing for the first time that uh, it's for the first time in years or the first time ever for some of these, uh, you know, Western media, them actually talking about organ harvesting mm. because the China tribunal had come out and said that it was happening. So it was interesting to see that, like, you know, we were in Hong Kong at the time. Remember, it was mm-hmm. last summer. Oh, no. Summer, summer 2019, 2019, where like the suddenly last summer kind of faded into yeah. obscurity. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, suddenly you see The Guardian covering organ harvesting and mm. The New York Times and, you know. Yeah, they they never talk about it. So yeah, the New York Times covered it. I the, I don't remember seeing them talk about the Giant Tribunal. I saw it on NBC though. I saw it on NBC. Yeah, though that that story kind of faded away. Like the, like most media is is very vocal about uh, Xinjiang, for example. Um, 
yeah, for some reason, like the China Tribunal, the fact that the Chinese Communist Party is is killing its own citizens for their organs, that story didn't stick around too long. Oh, it's an old story, Chris. But it never happened back when it was an old story. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, I also, like, as bad as the Uyghur concentration camps are, killing people for their organs is, like, a whole other level. Well, which it's horrible. also something they're doing to the Uyghurs. Right, mm-hmm. but, like, that's not being covered typically by the media that are covering the concentration camps. Yeah, like you don't, you hardly ever hear about, at least my impression is you hardly hear about the organ harvesting of Uyghurs, Mm. despite all the other coverage. But I think um, it's important, like we've talked about like what the Western world can do. I think it's important to remember that there is a very narrow window for when that can happen. Uh, Right now, China is very vulnerable to sanctions. But Shelley has mentioned They're trying to eliminate that weakness. They're trying to create their digital currency. They're trying to create alternate systems. Already, China has an incredibly powerful tool to sanction the West. We discovered this in the coronavirus when suddenly, you know, they put pressure like, don't talk about the origin of the coronavirus. Otherwise, you won't get PPEs Mm. because Mm. all of this is made in China now. So more and more, we will find that the ability of the West to put pressure on China diminishes as China is able to in, put pressure on the West. Definitely. And and that's why I, I think one of the other really important things that the West uh, needs to do, and, and incidentally, I, I would, um, I tend not to use the phrase the West because I also think democracies in Asia like Japan and, and Korea and, and others uh, need to be part of this as well. But um, That's a better way to put it. The democratic world um, needs to reduce its um, its strategic dependency on China and diversify supply chains. So make sure that uh, whether it's PPE or or any other project product that we're currently dependent on China for, we we start sourcing it from other places, uh, either producing it ourselves uh, or uh, from from our allies or or, or other uh, markets like like India, like uh, uh, Japan, Korea. Uh, South America, uh, you know, there are plenty of places in the world that we sh- we ought to be increasing trade with. Where even countries that that have, you know, plenty of countries have human rights challenges, um, but but countries that uh, uh, you know, it, it is not such a a huge uh, both ethical uh, uh, dilemma and um, and and national interest uh, dilemma. Uh, for us to, to to trade with. So diversifying our, our supply chains, I think, is really important. It's it's amazing because Xi Jinping said this in the new five-year plan that they came out with, where he literally said that the goal is to, you know, lessen Chinese dependence on other countries while at the same time making other industries dependent on China. So they literally said that this is what they're going to do. And it's like everybody's ignoring that happened. Well, we should be on this particular issue. We, we should be learning from Xi Jinping in reverse and uh, uh, making ourselves less dependent on China. And, uh, and yeah. So I know as somebody who's been very involved and passionate about Hong Kong for so many years, everything that's happened can't be easy for you to see. Are you at all hopeful for the future of Hong Kong or like what, what's your feeling now? Yeah, I mean, my feeling now is definitely incredibly sad um, to see uh, this great city, the city that was, uh, was once my home, uh, where I began my career, both as a journalist and as a, a human rights activist. I mean, I, I, I was involved in human rights work for other parts of Asia from Hong Kong when I lived there. So I was uh, speaking out in Hong Kong for Myanmar, for East Timor, for North Korea. Um, so incredibly sad to see that space um, just evaporate and, and Hong Kong become uh, a, a totally CCP-controlled city. And and especially sad right now to see the Apple Daily uh, forced to close, essentially strangled to, to, to death. Um, uh, because um, it was a, a paper that I wrote for every week, and and that um, I write for many publications around the world, but it was it was almost always my favorite publication to write for because um, they gave me complete freedom to write about 
what I wanted. There was no um, uh, there was no editorial sort of uh, restriction. There was no not even a word count <laughs> restriction. So theoretically, I could write sort of. I mean, I tried not to be too long, but I could go a lot longer than I would for many other publications. So, so really sad uh, about that, and really sad for the courageous staff of of the Apple Daily. Um, so, yeah, right now, feeling very um, pretty pretty bleak about Hong Kong. I think to answer your question, am I hopeful? I am hopeful. I think for a few reasons. Um, firstly, firstly, I, I mean, if one d- didn't have hope that freedom would one day prevail, um, you may as well kind of get, give up because you, you've got to have that hope to sustain uh, uh, the, the cause. But secondly, history shows that dictators don't last forever. A lot of uh, countries have changed uh, when, they, when we least expected them to, whether it was the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, I myself have been involved in struggles for freedom in places like East Timor, uh, and uh, of course, Burma, Myanmar uh, ha- had a glimmer of hope, and now that's been reversed. So sometimes there's a step forward and a step back. Um, but I-, I think history does show uh, overall that uh, dictators don't last forever, and that gives me hope. And the third thing that gives me hope is the courage and commitment of Hong Kong people. Um, I mean, I was at a uh, a rally and protest uh, on uh, June the 12th. Um, to mark the second anniversary of of uh, one of the big uh, protests in Hong Kong in 2019, um, and there were literally thousands and thousands of Hong Kongers, many of whom have recently arrived in the UK, taking part in this. Somebody told me they thought there could be 10,000. I don't know if that's correct, but certainly there were several thousand. Um, and the spirit that they uh, had was was extraordinary. I mean, they were cheerful. They were determined uh, uh, they were they were committed um, and we marched from from we had a rally at Marble Arch and then marched from Marble Arch to Trafalgar Square uh, and I spoke at the the final rally in Trafalgar Square but just seeing Trafalgar Square filled with Hong Kongers um, gave me hope that uh, they haven't given up even even those who've gone into exile and um, so if they haven't given up we we can't give up either I think that's a very important message. It's it's sometimes darkest before the dawn. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Benedict, thank you so much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure having you on. For anyone watching who wants to follow you, uh, I know you're not writing for the Apple Daily anymore, uh, but uh, where can they where can they follow you? Well, probably the easiest way is to follow me on Twitter. I'm just by my name, Benedict Rogers, uh, or they can look at Hong Kong Watch's website, which is hongkongwatch.org. Great. Well, yeah, take take care. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking soon about the next horrible thing to happen to Hong Kong, sadly. Absolutely. Thanks very much for having me. Great to be with you. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guys, I, j- I just realized something. After this interview with Benedict, we've been guilty of violating the national security law. We've been talking about targeted sanctions on China and Hong Kong. We haven't just been talking about targeted sanctions. We've been encouraging countries. Actively recommending. Yes, to sanction Hong Kong and China. So that's, that. yeah, that definitely does seem to put us in violation of the NSL. Do you think we shouldn't go back to Hong Kong right now? I think that if they applied the law retroactively on Apple Daily already, we've been in trouble since you know 2014 so, <laughs> when we first covered the umbrella movement yeah, in hong kong ex- exactly probably probably before that if spent we spent a night in the tents remember that yeah wow. it's kind of crazy to think about right now just how hopeful people were oh yeah at the time i i remember you know walking around and then we met joe feng suo there for the first time right He's and tiananmen he, survivor yeah and he talked about how much it reminded him of the the, the kind of the spirit of tiananmen square <laughs> protesters and yeah it really <laughs> kind of followed through with the spirit of tiananmen too <laughs> well just like a very slow motion one tank wreck yeah it's just like instead of just wrecking it directly with a tank that just took 
oh gosh, what was it? Only seven years, six years for them to essentially crush everything. Yeah. yeah. So, so who was the uh, in Hong Kong situation? Who was the Hong Kong tank man who stood in front of this long line of tanks with his shopping bags, resisting? Well, it was two million people in that one march. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but, yeah, that I mean, I'll never forget that either. That was in, insane to see that many people on one street. Yeah, but I, th- I think you're making a good point. Like the Communist Party has wised up about how to do things like this. They like there was a lot of fear in Hong Kong, especially in 2019 when we were there, that, oh, they're going to send in the tanks. They're going to send in the tanks. The Communist Party is smarter than that now. They're not going to do that. They're going to create some stupid legal system that they can achieve exactly what they want. And then... What are people going to do? It's interesting because I think I remember we were all because we had a that hotel room that looked over one of the main roads in uh, Central. Pretty close to Ledge Cove. Yeah. And we were just like, well, if the tanks come, we can see them coming. But yeah, I mean, they have riot police, so they were never going to send in the military anymore. Mm-hmm. That's one thing they did. But like you said, yes, the other thing is lawfare. Yeah. So. If, if it had been like a massacre. Tesla would not be going into China and licking boot. I I think if it were like bloody bodies on the streets of Hong Kong. Yeah, Tesla would have had to wait several years. Yeah, yeah, at least 10 years or so. No, I mean. Three years, but yeah. Three years. Like, yeah. Well, think about the whole, you know, George Bush doing is secretly sending someone. Oh, yeah, that month. Yeah, to be like, no, don't worry. It's going to be okay. George Bush Sr. Tiananmen Square Massacre. Yeah, it's just, I don't, I mean, maybe I'm too cynical about the fact that I think that they would have bounced back with the Olympics in 2022, no problem, even if they had sent in tanks in 2019. If the world fails to boycott the 2022 Olympics, we have failed. Right. But also, like, think about how much of the world the Chinese Communist Party has co-opted, right? So, like— The entirety? Uh, yeah, but in different ways, right? So there's, you know, 100-something countries that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative— so I would say all of those countries are to some degree co-opted. Many of them are in debt, factual financial debt to, to China. So they have that leverage uh, being held over them. And then you have, you know, the Western countries are co-opted in like different ways, but it's all the subtle infiltration, right? Like, like you've got the Chinese communist money uh, investing in American tech companies. Uh, you've got uh, American investment companies like BlackRock that are invested in the China market and want to be able to get the money out of China eventually that they've invested. So they're going to fight tooth and nail for the Communist Party. Right? Or just how we are dependent on medical supplies from China now. Me- yeah, medical supplies, vitamins, um, you know, steel, a lot of manufacturing, uh, you know, our iPhones, uh, you know, all these things, it's going to take a lot of time to move the production out of China and American companies want to resist that. So essentially like you've got American and other, uh, you know, whether it's German companies or or British companies, they're essentially, the companies are co-opted. And because we know that companies, large companies have a disproportionate uh, impact on policy, you know, in, in America and wherever, then like that's essentially how the Western countries are co-opted. So despite, you know, uh, whatever morally, you know, people like Antony Blinken want to do, right, he's going to be limited. Biden is limited. Nancy Pelosi is limited uh, because there's so much corporate interest trying to push against any type of anti-Chinese Communist Party legislation. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing, though, the flip side of that is in 1989, you know, China didn't have that much of an impact on the rest of the world. So it was easier for the rest of the world to kind of ignore the Tiananmen Square massacre in a certain way because it didn't directly directly affect them. Now you can't really pretend that China doesn't affect the rest of the world. And that's one of the arguments that people have been making to engage with China or something like, oh, you know, it's going to bring more freedom, that kind of stuff. It's obviously no, not true anymore. It's American tech that is that has built the surveillance system in Xinjiang. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just incredible that, you know, we can still kind of have companies being like, well, you know, if we go in and we work with them, that's not a problem. Uh, but it was interesting. I saw an article, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal the other day about how 
we are vulnerable because the largest chip maker in the world, microchip maker, uh, semiconductor, is TSMC in Taiwan. And it was this article about how it's, you know, the world is vulnerable because we depend on this one company in Taiwan so much for our microchips. And who's writing the article about how vulnerable we are because we depend on China for, you know, all this other stuff? Like nobody's writing that article. Oh, wait. So the point wasn't that like that that, that chip maker does have business relations with the Chinese Communist Party, which is stupid that a Taiwanese company would no. be doing. Yeah, it was that the rest of the world could be at risk if China takes over Taiwan or if the coronavirus, you know, something takes out this chip maker in Taiwan, then the rest of the world is vulnerable. Oh, OK. Uh, right. But we're already like way more vulnerable for so many other things than just that. Right. It, for on our vulnerability mm. to China, like to the Chinese Communist Party is huge. But you know, it, people don't really want to talk about it. And I I don't know if it's because it's not evident or if it's because, you know, it's nobody wants to touch that. Well, hey, how about we write an opinion piece for The Wall Street Journal that says that? Do you think they'll accept it? Like, or we could at least write a, a BuzzFeed listicle top 10 ways uh, the U.S. is vulnerable to China, right? And you can list things like, you know, solar panels being made in China, car batteries being made in China, is it, if it's uh, going to be a list of China, everything that's made in China, we're going to need more than 10. Yeah. Oh, OK, sure. <laughs> uh, but top 10 thing. Top, okay. Yeah, top 10. Yeah. This, is, this isn't a list of like, you know, 10,000 things that we're vulnerable for. Maybe it should be a list of 10,000 things because then people would kind of realize how vulnerable we are. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that this is part of the tragedy of Hong Kong, too, is that you know, people in Hong Kong, you know, when we were there, some of the protesters told us things like, we know this is probably not going to end well for us. Mm -hmm. But they felt that it was worth something, at least, if they could kind of be the thing that wakes the rest of the world up to the dangers of the Chinese Communist Party. Like, if you want to talk about who was Tank Man, it was kind of like Hong Kong was Tank Man That's for the rest of the world. Point. That they they knew that they were put the, putting themselves in the line of fire uh, and that it was, you know, possibly hopeless because Hong Kong wasn't like Taiwan. It's already controlled uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. So they knew what they were doing, but they also thought, you know, if we can at least be a warning to the rest of the world, we can stop uh, the Chinese regime from, you know, taking over the entire world, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it was helpful, but like, I, I feel like even the coronavirus, a global pandemic that killed millions, hasn't fully woken up the world. Well, I think this is why one th reason that the Chinese Communist Party is also very afraid of this investigation into the possibility of the lab leak thing, uh, because essentially they kind of got away with their cover up where people weren't really blaming them for that initial month-long cover-up that led to the pandemic. Yes, thanks to Western media and Western medical journals that were being funded by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, they have some things that they're complicit about regarding the lab leak thing, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just the idea that, okay, they kind of got away with it. So now if we're going to reopen this can of worms and look at just how culpable they might have been, you know, they're scared of that the way that they're scared of sanctions. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, in terms of the, the lab leak hypothesis, like this interestingly exposes the type of vulnerability that we have, which is that regardless of whether ultimately it is objectively true or not that the, you know, COVID-19 leaked from a, a Chinese lab, like the idea of investigating it shows how vulnerable we are because it shows the infiltration of the Chinese Communist Party into so many aspects of economics and politics, right? So like you've got the obvious ones like China, uh, you know, controlling PPE uh, and, and medical stuff that they can hold over our heads, but also their control over scientific journals because, you know, as you mentioned on China Uncensored, the Chinese Communist Party uh, is paying Western uh, scientific publishing companies to publish Chinese journals. And so these Western c companies that uh, that control, you know, Nature Medicine uh, Journal and The Lancet uh, are both those, the publishing companies that own those also were getting money from 
uh, yeah, they're dependent. Ch- Chinese companies. So th- there's there's that dependency, right? That creates a type of vulnerability in an incentive to self censor. And then on top of that, you've got you know like the the NIH, the U.S. National Institutes of Health, that were funding uh, Eco Health Alliance that then. Uh, were involved in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And that, like everyone now at the National Institutes of Health uh, and people like uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, you know, signed off on this. And like, so you've got all this complicity and years of working with China. Uh, so like everyone's got these these ties where they're either like financially dependent or uh, or they're, you know, embarrassed by the ties that they had, uh, you know, at like at so many different levels, it prevents any type of honesty uh, about what really happened, any type of real honest investigation into what happened. Well, I think, the, the, I mean, the coronavirus is a perfect example of like why we created the show. Years ago, we saw that something like this could happen. The incredible reach of the Chinese Communist Party in American society is dangerous and something could go really wrong. The coronavirus is the perfect example of that. Right. And Millions so, dead. And so Chris Chappell decided to start China Uncensored and scream into the void. I am Cassandra. I mean, I think that I, we have to keep screaming, though. You know, there's not, there's not really any other choice. Mm-hmm. Like, what are we going to do? I mean, think about what has happened to people in Hong Kong over the last two years. Uh, there was an interesting story. It was about these three Hong Kong or five Hong Kong protesters who managed to make it to Taiwan in a boat. Unlike like the Cubans. Yeah. Like unlike the 12 people who tried and then got uh, taken in by the Chinese Coast Guard and then ended up in prison in mainland China. Yeah. These were people who actually, you know, made it to Taiwan and then the Taiwanese government couldn't quite acknowledge them. And they they helped them. But then they were like you need to leave Taiwan because you can't be here or else this might be a pretext for war that the Chinese Communist Party could actually launch an offensive on Taiwan based on them harboring um, dissidents. So actually behind the scenes, the U.S. State Department reached out and helped these people get to the U.S. essentially. This was under the Trump administration because they came in early January to oh, the U.S., okay. but the story is just being reported now. Wow, that's a great story. It's a, it's an incredible story. And, you know, it's kind of, think about, you know, Hong Kong, when under Mao was the place that mainland Chinese people fled to, mm-hmm. like people would swim from Guangdong province to Hong Kong to try to make it. And one of these protesters who kind of is in the U.S. now and fled by boat, his grandmother swam from mainland China to Hong Kong. Wow. And now he had to flee Hong Kong uh, in a boat. And then he had to swim from Taiwan to America. That's incredible. But, but I, I do want to interview these people. I think they have to be a little bit anonymous right now. Yeah, okay. But it is, I mean, it's incredible. Like Hong Kong was the place of Operation Yellowbird, right? Where people were helping, you know, Hong Kong celebrities and even Hong Kong triads were helping Tiananmen Square massacre survivors <laughs> flee out of China. I like the idea of like Hong Kong gangsters being like, like, you know, we like crime, but, you know, Tiananmen massacre is too much. Like we're going to help those victims. Before the Communist Party co-opted the triads as well. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. but <laughs> the, the triads were good once. Is that what you're saying? Ah. Uh... No, just the Communist Party is worse than the triads, I think. And is able to influence everyone. Yes. The Communist Party is is the worst gangster of all. Yeah. And and I think that's the main message, you know, saying we were screaming into the void. Sometimes when you scream into the void, the the void screams back. Uh, The the point is, I'm trying to make, I think, is that, you know, as, as we were saying earlier, this won't stop with Hong Kong. It won't stop with Taiwan. The end goal, and the Communist Party is very clear about this, is to dominate the world. And unless we use this limited window of opportunity to do something now, that's going to disappear. Like imagine a world where we are financially dependent on whatever currency China uses. Imagine the leverage that would give the Chinese Communist Party. That might not be that far away. That would be terrifying. 
And especially the way that with their new digital currency, they can essentially, they have the power not only to monitor everything you do, but to instantly cut off your access. Like, that's terrifying to me. Yeah. Yeah. Time to move to Mars? Oh, no. But Elon Musk is already co-opted by the Chinese Communist Party. There's no escape. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I like the idea of Mars as the last democratic bastion. We, we have to we have to drill into the center of the Earth. What? That's like the opposite of going to Mars. Oh, yeah. you mean create a, a, a democratic republic inside the hollow Earth. <laughs> <laughs> inside the hollow flat Earth. Uh, oh, I have questions about the hollow flat Earth. <laughs> well, the Earth can be flat. It just depends on the thickness of the flatness. There might be enough room for it the for there to be a hollow core to the flat earth. Yeah. Is the reason we make jokes like this is because we spend like an hour talking about how the world is on the brink of an authoritarian unending nightmare. Yeah, and it's always the same. Like what we talked about what Matt was mentioning with the lab leak, like that the same reason is in every other industry, right? Co-opting individual people. Uh, you know, to have their interests aligned with the Communist Party, making, you know, industries financially dependent on it. It's the same playbook and they can use it over and over again because we never learn for yeah. some reason. Well, that's why so many people were concerned about Biden as president, because uh, the, co the Communist Party did this with his son, Hunter Biden. Yeah, I, I except mean, nobody wanted to cover that. Yes, strangely, strangely. <laughs> the void. Hey, it's he still not... hasn't divested, by the way, from that company. He said he oh. was going to divest from that investment company, but nope. Well, I have an idea. How about we digest Hunter Biden? What does that even mean? Most problems in life can be solved through cannibalism. All right, Something yeah. my mother told me. All right. I, I feel like now this has gone completely off the rails. Yeah, the void. It's... Hey, it's not illegal to scream in America. For now. So you can still scream into the void. I mean, unless YouTube, which is owned by Google, and all of their close connections to China, cuts off our screaming. Remember how much they, like every episode we did about Hong Kong in 2019 when the protests were going on, demonetized, age restricted. Yeah, it they was were, bad. That and the coronavirus, like YouTube really did the CCP a solid by clamping down on our Hong Kong and coronavirus episodes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that that what the, the way it affected us is we just lost a lot of money. But the way it affected the overall media environment was that a lot fewer media covered things. And when they did cover them, they covered them less or they covered them without showing as much of what was going on on the ground. So like the overall impact was much greater, I think, than the impact on just our own bottom line. Well, no, it's not just that like we lost money. If we hadn't set up a system where fans could directly contribute to the show and we didn't have that kind of fan base that valued what we were doing, we would have been out of business. There would be no China Uncensored. Yeah. So it's not just like a loss of money. It's like this would be a channel that was gone. Right. No, but I mean, my point is that we covered it anyway, knowing that we were going to take a loss on the ads because we still had this other form of revenue from, from viewer contributions. But for most other media, the impact was much greater because it actually, they changed how they covered things and what they covered. Right. I mean, we don't know directly what kind of decisions go on in the editing room. But, you know, from my experience, you know, in, in nearly two decades as a journalist, like most of the editorial decisions, uh, the readers and viewers never see. Most editorial decisions are actually just about which stories to cover and which nine out of 10 stories to not cover. And so when those decisions are getting made, you never really see that. So you don't actually, you can't really see or measure the impact of this kind of self-censorship based uh, system. Well, 90% of all media is owned by like five companies and these gigantic mega corporations have a lot of interest in China. So what decisions are being made? Like a news company has to satisfy their corporate sponsors. Yeah. 
just another way that the U.S. is vulnerable is when there's Chinese money involved in you know, sponsorship for media companies. So it's just the list. The list goes on and on. Yeah. Well, the the, the only way to solve this is the con the Communist Party needs to be treated like uh, it's the internet. Why not? It needs to be treated like Nazi Germany. Everything goes back to Nazi Germany. But seriously, that's it's. So it you're has saying to be IBM should invest in China? <laughs> Haven't they? They already did uh -huh. a chip sale in the '90s. And yeah. it has to be that like the people of the United States of America find it intolerable that any of these corporations are doing anything with the Chinese Communist Party. It has to be such a major outcry from the public. The void needs to scream back right, at but, those in power. But you got to like, what was America's view of Nazi Germany in the, the late 30s? It a was, great place to invest. Well, in a lot of ways, yes. Right. It was, it was, you know, Hollywood was adjusting certain things for the German market. And there were some Americans who were like, oh, like it's, it's kind of bad there, or I don't agree with it. But there were a lot of Americans who were like super pro uh, what was happening in, or in Nazi just Germany. Or in denial. There was a lot of denial right. about what's happening, kind of like with like the Uyghur genocide right. and organ and, harvesting. And, and well, I mean, imagine if Western companies had been involved in the Holocaust. Right. But oh, the, wait, IBM was. Yeah. And like the New York Times like barely covered it. And you had like Jewish newspapers who were like screaming into the void, like, like this is happening to the Jews. And everyone's like, oh, no, that's just biased because they're Jewish newspapers. Right. And then like who was right ultimately. Uh, so it's just I would say it's 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 not like if people recognized it was Nazi Germany in China now that they would do something. They would just do the exact same thing they did in the 1930s, which is be like, well, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it's being the problems are exaggerated. I'm sure it's not actually a threat to the rest of the world. I feel like when Benedict was on, we were kind of ending on a note of hope. And now we've just completely brought that 180 degrees. <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Kanesta. We'll are see we... you next time in the void. <laughs> is this, are we really doing this? Is this the end? This is, it's never, it's not, it's the, not end. the end. Okay. Keep it's screaming. <laughs>